How are we doing out there? So I am grateful for many things <clears throat> at the moment for being in the presence of such intelligence and creativity, but also for such a great audience. Thank you for coming and for what I perceive to be your close listening. Poets love listening. So my presentation is going to be a mixture of ideas and poems, ideas I've been thinking about and working on for years, and the poems that have come out of that process. <clears throat> 25, maybe 30 years ago, I made a departure. I had been writing poems which were in the narrative mode, the little thread of an idea that you can follow as it weaves its way through the tree trunks to the end of the poem. I was pleased enough with that kind of writing, but I hungered for something else, something wild, something a little out of the ordinary. And so I decided to try to get there. Intuitively, I sort of recognized that the voice that I was looking for was hidden somewhere in the unconscious. But getting there was a bit of a problem. Right? Trained as a scientist, I had this linear thought process in the brain that kept me away from some of the areas of the brain which connect more deeply into the emotional surfaces. So the, I didn't have a word for it at the time, but the DLPFC, right, <laughs> was in charge. And what I wanted was the default network to connect into the deeper regions of the brain. And so I conducted an, a long experiment on my own brain. Now, since it's close to Halloween, <laughs> I don't want you to think that I moved it from its socket or that I sent Igor to the morgue. But what I did do was to experiment with the process of writing in different states. And without going into detail, over several years and many hours, I hit upon a technique which um, caused me to write at 2.30 in the morning, not awake, immersed in REM sleep, with the lights off, writing under the covers, and then hoping to read it in the morning. <laughs> so, what I want to do is to show you what I came up with and perhaps the differences or similarities between the two writing processes coming from two different parts of the brain. And so going back to 25 years ago, I'm going to read you a poem that followed that narrative thread. And then I'm going to read you a poem that followed this more associative thread. So the first poem is called Words. My father used few words. He moved fearless from task to task, as if they were meals to be eaten. Our house grew ingle nooks from the imagination of the carpenter he became. From tree limbs of summer, I watched him tote and saw, driving nails with the same muscles that lost baseballs over West Texas outfields. Leaves turned, snow fell. All that whiteness came. Standing in the emptiness of transition, he spoke, imploring wisdom. Then when the inkwell went dry, he reached with great and somber hands to turn out the light. And now, a poem written around the same time, seeking that wildness. The petunia at the end of the garden is the one with the cantilevered system, the cell system. Friday morning, and she took me for a walk, and I saw how a basket could be a cell, and a cell a basket. A juggler changing hands. Anything can be lost in a minute. Pouty, she said, floating by on her parade float. 
and nothing mattered but the turn at the corner of her mouth. Do you hear a difference? <laughs> yep. Maybe you noticed it didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> but I'd like to remind you that sense was not the object. What I was looking for was the way the brain can skip from image to image and be quirky, can disobey rules, and do so with a brand of logic other than the linear way of thinking. Because somehow out of that, even though it doesn't make sense, I felt something happening in that poem and others like it that kept me going after this more and more and more. And so I wanted to protect this kind of writing and so I gave it a different name. I called it Harvey Ellis. And um, Harvey came from my father's first name and Ellis from my mother's maiden name. And I can't tell if I've done them well or not at this point. But this separation helped me to do this writing and keep it without a history. Because the history influences what you do to a certain extent. What you've produced in the way of your writing encourages you to write extending that process for forward. I wanted this to have a completely fresh start. All right, so over the years, this changed a little bit. And so now I'm going to read you two poems side by side on a similar subject, maybe 10 years later. Uh, this is a subject on the death of my brother, the body of my brother. First, it belonged to my mother, or seemed to, stuffed into her like a foot in a sock. It took care of itself, filling out into home runs, high jumps. There were times it must have been afraid, hiding in a bunker in South Vietnam, having happened to it, whatever it was that makes bodies years later jump out of bed in the middle of the night, not awake, sweating and shouting. Last time I saw it, it was older than mine, thinned out by too many cigarettes and favors given away. Now they've taken it from the hospital bed where it gasped out his last punchline <clears throat> and put it in a box that no one will ever see again. Though we stand around it, observing gestures even death cannot remove. Head tilt, wry smile, hands the same as my hands, crossed over his chest as they never were in life. A few pictures and mementos scattered around it as if they were crumbs of a happy life. And so now from the Harvey Ellis voice. Missing Bill. Your arrival was speckled with departure, the way air is folded into stone. Now the light in the room is like coffee, and the places you have left in the wall keep changing. October will come again and go before your dark eyes land on me. See how the full moon startles the darkness on the floor by the window. It will pass over us whether we see it or not. Your patience is enormous and has wings. This may come as a surprise to you, but I don't think so. So I'm not gonna critique my own work, that would be foolish. But what I have noticed is that while Watts in this poem goes to the edge of grief to the precipice, if you will. Ellis, though feeling the same grief, handles it with a lighter touch. It's able, therefore, well, the anguish becomes less damaging somehow in the Ellis poem. Okay, so now I didn't know whether writing this way was gonna be interpreted in anybody else's brain besides mine. It came from my brain, right? I might like it but does it transmit to anybody else? So I started reading these poems along with others at readings and they seemed to go over okay. And then a few got published in literary magazines. One won a prize. Uh, Garrison Keillor read one on the radio and then now three books are published. So something's working in this voice. If it's not that linear thread that I was getting away from, then what other thread is it 
that is coming together in this voice? And do these two voices now talk to each other and influence each other, which is, in fact, what has happened over the time? So it begs the question, can my unconscious speak to your unconscious without using the logical formula we use for sentences? Can we speak in other ways? It would seem so. So let's try this again. The poem from one side and then the poem from the other side. And this time, the poems are about fathers and sons. Fragment at the beginning of something. My son brings me a stone and asks which star it fell from. He is serious, and so I must be careful. Even though I know he will place it among those things that will leave him someday, and he will go on gathering. For this is one of those moments that turns suddenly towards you, opening as it turns, as if for an instant we paused on the edge of a heartbeat and then pressed forward, conscious of the fear that runs beside us and how lovely it is to be with each other in the long, resilient mornings. And now the Ellis voice on a similar subject called ancestors. My ancestors surround me like walls of a canyon, quiet, stone hard, their ideas drift over me like breezes at sunset. We gather sticks and make settlements. What we do is only partly our own and partly continuation down through the chromosomes. My son, my baby, sleeps behind me, stirring in the night for the touch that lets him continue. He is arranging in his small form the furniture and windows of his home. It will be a lot like mine. It will be a lot like theirs. So the difference between the poems begins to be a little less. We still hear the sort of quirky voice in the other side. But that quirky voice also comes across sometimes. I found even when I'm writing a, uh, an essay and I'm looking for a metaphor or an image, that I can zone myself into that space that I've learned how to perfect in the middle of the night, perfect maybe use in the middle of the night, and come up with something that I would not have predicted otherwise. So the unconscious can be trained. The unconscious can be unroofed in order to access the deeper aspects. And so um, I think it's made me a, a different kind of person to do this, maybe deeper. I don't know, maybe crazy, I don't know. So I have three poems that I'm gonna read, then quit. Um, it's gonna go like this, Ellis, Watts, Ellis. And these are more modern, so you'll hear how the voices have come uh, in the present. First one's called Lunch. She served something hot and rhetorical. She said it would make your cinnamon white. She set the table with lilies and sexual tension, the way her presence came into her body. At the table, they spoke as if they'd already spoken all they needed to. The sun was in the window. Something was just starting up. This is a poem that I wrote uh, this summer at Squaw Valley. You were there, but I don't think you heard this poem. It's called The Delicate Sprigs of Love. He is sitting next to her. The firmness of her thigh is pressed against his. There is no light between them. He listens so heavily into the heartbeat of her that he hears the murmuring of aspens on the hillside. He tells her this. How could he sit next to her if he didn't tell her this? She is beautiful in the manner in which there is so much beauty, it almost cancels itself. I can lie down in the golden shape of your shadow, he says, and no longer question myself. She wonders if they were just prisoners of the freedom that brought them there, or if to love him would mean waiting for promises lying awake in the draft of crossing stars. 
they kiss. And though he is still alone in the fear that no one will ever kiss him, he is sitting next to her. And because it's almost Halloween, this last little poem from Harvey Ellis called The Dead. The dead walk around in costumes imitating the dead. <laughs> or what we think of as dead. Ghoulish and apart into unwhole body parts. Part recognizable, part suggestive of something horrible, just so we can get an adrenaline surge that makes us feel alive. Ironic how the dead remind us of that, all curled up and fishy. Thank you very much. <laughs>